we continue our sermon series on a reflection on the scriptural topic of doors. In Revelation, Jesus knocks on perhaps the most important door, and that is the door to your heart. How do we open? How do we let them in? A lot of doors in scripture. Um, Jesus is the door he taught at one time. So not only is he trying to get in to our heart, something that only we can allow him to do, something a door that only we can open, but he is wanting us to walk through him as the door. What did that look like? We reflected upon that. We've talked about open doors, discerning those. Those are, those are tricky. Uh, there's not just one type of open door. There are open doors that, that we are aware of but don't want to walk through. How do we overcome that? There are open doors that we're not even aware of. We just can't see them. And then there's open doors <clears throat> that we're not supposed to walk through. Just because it's open doesn't mean you walk through it. Uh, Delilah's, Delilah's house had a door that was open to Samson. He wasn't supposed to walk through it. Plenty of open doors out there that we need to stay away from. And there are closed doors. And how do, how do you discern that? Uh, is a door really closed for you? And, and if it is, why, why are you still standing there? Why are you wasting your resources? There are plenty of other doors out there for you to find, uh, to find your preferred future. Or is it a closed door that you're supposed to knock on? Uh, God wants you to go through that door. Just because it's closed doesn't mean it's not for you. And then last week we focused on a really strange door. That's a door that is closed and knocking won't open it. Uh, you, you pretty much had to tear the wall down that the door was hanging on to get through it. So that was very interesting. Uh, understanding how to discern doors is very important because doors represent the transition places to the most important spaces in our life. Uh, it's a very important topic. When we choose well with the doors in our life, we step into a preferred future. Life becomes better and we become better at life when we discern the, source, or the doors in our life well. Um, not only do we step into a preferred future, but better choices in the doors leads to fewer regrets. So it is a good topic for us to be reflecting upon this morning. I want to reflect on, um, I, it, I found a hard time discerning how to describe this door. It was either the door of revelation or the door of dependence. Uh, and I think what I've, what I've gotten to is the revelation aspect of it is on the other side of the door. So the gist of the revelation side, what is on the other side of this door, is that God wants to reveal something to you um, that God has yet to reveal to you, something about God's self. But to get to that revelation, you got to go through this door. And uh, so I don't think it's the door of revelation. I think the door is the door of dependence. That is the door of depending on God. It is open. And if we walk through it, God reveals things to us about God that we didn't once previously know. The only thing is the door to dependence is kind of tricky and we're going to read we're going to read about that. So with that in mind, the passage I would like to read is a particular revelation that God gave to Peter. Now, this is someone who had been walking with uh, Jesus physically. Um, and this was after Jesus is gone. God still is revealing things to Peter that he had not up until this point. So you you may imagine God doesn't have anything to reveal to me. I, I know everything there is I need to know about God. Well, well, Peter continued to learn things about God, and I'm, I'm just guessing if he continued to, that probably we do too. So it is in chapter 12 of the book of Acts, uh, verse 11, the one verse I want to give you. It says, Then Peter came to himself and said, this is him talking to himself, this is a self-talk, the things you overhear while talking to yourself by Peter, quote, now I know without a doubt, now I know, I didn't know this before, now I do, 
that the Lord sent this angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating, end quote. The word of God for us, the people to God. Thanks be to God. So let me, let me set this revelation up for you in the book of Acts chapter 12. If you, if you read scripture on days other than Sunday, which I would encourage you to do, dust your Bible off, read it, it's not going to hurt you, then you'll be familiar with this particular chapter. Uh, Herod has just pleased the religious elites of his day by, by putting in jail James and killing him. And as he saw that this pleased the religious snobs of Jesus' day, he said, okay, well, I'm going to do that with Peter as well. So Herod puts Peter in jail. And while in jail, there is a scene of Peter in between two soldiers. And this is the place I think we find Peter depending upon God. We can call these, these soldiers... Um, this soldier's name is Rock, and this soldier's name is Hard Place. And Peter is right in the middle. Literally, it says, between two soldiers. And his response to being in jail, knowing that, that James has been killed recently, and that he's being put in jail to have the same sort of outcome, and now in between uh, two soldiers, it reads that... Uh, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, this is a few verses earlier, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Peter was sleeping. Now, now you, may, you may skip right across that verse that Peter was sleeping in jail, but this is a, this is a huge development in the life of Peter in depending upon God enough to be in that situation and just sleeping at rest. So Peter has uh, learned this lesson that I think started with when he was with Jesus in the boat. When the disciples were with Jesus in the storm, Jesus tried to start teaching them something about God. And you're going to hear this message. You're going to hear what I think Peter learned, which enabled him to rest. But I also think there's something for you individually to learn about God in this that, that is specific to you. So when Peter was with Jesus and the disciples in the boat and the storm arose, all the disciples were not as relaxed as Peter is now. They were flipping out. And this is, this is most of our response to being in between the two soldiers of rock and hard place. When we get in a situation that is sort of desperate and there's really no easy answer, we don't always respond in, in, in the ability to rest or sleep in the middle of the two guards. What is typical of people is, is typical of what the disciples did in the boat. We either fight or flight or freeze. And you could see this in all their responses. As the storm is whipping up, they are flipping out. And what is Jesus doing? He is sleeping in the boat. He begins this lesson with Peter on that day. I don't think Peter got it that day. I think it took a while for Peter to get it. And here, here's the lesson that Peter got, which I think he was exercising on this day. It is something like this. Of course, it's not spelled out in Scripture, but I mean, it just my interpretation is something like Peter knew that God could do more for Peter while Peter was sleeping than God could do for Peter while he was straining at the oars. Now you may find yourself in a situation like Peter um, where rock and hard place, there doesn't seem to be any good choice for you in your life. And, and it, this could be individually, but I think, I think we're all sort of going through this right now with uh, pandemic being one soldier, you know, uh, un, uh, unpredictable pandemic on one side and just ridiculous geopolitics on this side. Uh, not to mention the economy going poor. We're, we're sort of between a rock 
and a hard place, and, and many of us have the same responses that the disciples had, either fight, flight, or freeze. We, we want to fight someone, we want to hold someone responsible, and so we're blasting that all over Facebook, and people are firing back and forth, or we, the other part of us, we just want to avoid it, we don't want to look at it, we don't even want to think about it, we just, we just sweep all this stuff under the rug, or some of us who are caught in the middle of all this shrapnel, we just freeze, we don't know what to do. And in the midst of that, I think we get a lesson from Peter. And that is that if we are able in this, in this season of desperation where, where Peter was, this is, this is exactly where Peter is, in between a rock and a hard place, in a season of desperation where you can in that moment depend on God like never before. That's, that's where revelation happens. If in a season of desperation, we can depend on God rather than choosing fight, flight, or freeze, we will learn something about God that that we didn't know before. So the the simple little lesson for Peter was just to be able to rest, which I think is, is, is very profound. Now, now it's, it's a good question to ask. Okay, so I hear what you're saying, rest in, in the midst of all that's going on. And, and you know, that speaks to me, Brother Eddie, because I, I could use some rest. And, yeah, I'm anxious. And, you know, maybe I'm not all fight or not all flight or not all freeze. Maybe, maybe I'm a little of all the above, but I'm certainly more of one of those three things than I am rest or than I am receiving revelations from God. So, yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm kind of into what you're saying. How? How does one... How does one do that? How, you're basically asking, how, how, how was Peter enabled to rest in that situation? Here's, here's what I think Peter learned. I think Peter learned not only that God is able to do more while Peter is resting than what Peter is able to accomplish while straining at the oars, but I also think Peter learned that it is important to fixate your mind on things that you know are, are real rather than things you don't know are real. Now, now that may seem like, like a basic thought to many of us, but there are several places in Scripture where the followers of Jesus would say, you, you, you really need to be intentional about locking your mind on things that are true and noble and lovely. Because if you don't, you open your mind up to things that are not necessarily true or noble or lovely. One place, um, Paul put it like this. This is Ephesians 4.27. Uh, again, if you're a student of Scripture, you know, that you know this. Uh, he says to the church there at Ephesus, don't, don't, don't be saying things that are untrue, especially as it relates to each other, but don't be saying things that are untrue because when you do, uh, do you not know that you give the devil a foothold? Now, foothold is an interesting term, and it totally relates to a door. A foothold is like someone is going to shut the door, and you put your foot there, and they cannot completely shut the door. When you are, when you are thinking things and then saying things that are not necessarily true, Paul is saying, you are given darkness, an open door into your heart. And rather than being able to be at rest, you are filling your life with this fight or flight or freeze rather than it being able to, in this season of desperation, to depend on God. There's this great scene in this movie, Belvedere. Uh, it's this, this big old St. Bernard who, who walks into this pristine house and he's completely wet and he gets in the middle of the house and in slow motion does the whole the doggy I want to get dry thing from the head all the way, you know, down, and you see like slobber and wet and just dog going all over this nice, lovely house because the door was left wide open for the dog. Same way for us when we, when we think and then express things that we may or may not know is true. We give a foothold to darkness to just come on into our life and put this ridiculousness everywhere. I think it's a good lesson for all of us. I've heard 
Recently, people are very afraid about the way things are going in our country, the way things are going in the church. And uh, the, the main idea, I think the spirit of what is being said is it's, it's worse than ever. It's worse than ever. And uh, I just, I don't want to minimize what's going on. There are a lot of, there are a lot of hard things. But if you let a thought like it's worse than ever get in your mind, I really think you're opening yourself up for something that you may or may not know is true. Let me just, let me just point out um, a few things. So worse than ever, let's just take the pandemic. So surely you've heard of the Spanish flu that happened in 1918, okay, for which we were unprepared did not have the body of science to approach it, did not have um, the way to mass produce vaccines that we do now, didn't have the, didn't have the ability to treat it like we do now. Okay. So we were, we are better off in that way, but just in the amount of people that got the Spanish flu, one out of 10 people on the planet, one out of 10 people on the planet got it. And hear this, that's why they call it the black sometimes flu. One out of 10 of the people that got it, one out of 10 of them died. So the numbers on the Spanish flu were worse, period. That's not worse. And you may think, well, well, wars are getting worse. Look at Afghanistan. Well, do you know that four years before the Spanish flu broke out as one of the scariest things we'd ever experienced, World War I finally came to an end. Afghanistan is horrible. I, 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 not one American citizen should die in Afghanistan. But in total, we've lost about 2,400 of our boys and girls. And that's horrible. In World War I, 100,000. We had just lost 100,000 of our best when, when the Spanish flu hit. And that was at a time when we only had about 100 million people here. A much larger percentage and numerically much larger. Now you may say, yeah, but you know, okay, okay, I get you with the pandemic, I get you with the wars, yeah, that was bad. By the way, 20 years later, World War II started cooking up. And if you think it's that far away, uh, the World War II, if you, were, if you grew up in 1980, the distance between the end of World War II and 1980 is the same distance between 1980 and where we are now. It's not that far. But then you may say, yeah, but the economy, I don't know if it's going to crash. Hear me. Just a few years after the Spanish flu began the Great Depression, a decade that we get the word depression from. And if you think this is worse than then, economically, I I just, I have no place of agreement there. Do you know, if you just look at the products that came out of the Great Depression, Take one of the best meats you could get at the time. Spam. Spam came out of the Great Depression. Go, go, old timers, will, uh, uh, take spam and compare it to what you have in your cupboards. And then say, better or worse. Now, some of my old timers are watching. They're going, I love spam. What's he talking about? <laughs> you can fry it. You can do this. You can do that. Okay, whatever. Games. Out of the depression, our kids started playing games like kick the can. Compare that with the amount of games we have today. There is just, there is no comparison. So it is not worse than ever. Now, it may be worse than anything you've lived through, but it's not worse than anything the world has lived through. God has seen this. Humanity has seen this, our country has seen this, and guess what? We came out stronger than we were then. So speak things to yourself that are true. The the most insidious, I think, of the self-talk is is the what-ifs. What if this? What if that? What if granny with a baseball bat? What if? The, the The good thing about what if is that it's inexhaustible. And you can do it all day. If you're bored and you got nothing to do, you can do what if all day. You can fight, fight, or flight, or freeze with what if till the cows come home and you can entertain yourself. The problem with what if is that 
I'd say well over 90% of your what ifs never happen. They never happen. And the problem with that is you are filling your mind with things, literally, literally, that are not true because they don't happen. This is why it is the definition of ungodly because God does not concern God's self with things that are not going to happen. What ifs? Close the door on it and think of things that are true. I think, I think if I were Peter, I could have easily thought in that jail cell when I was in between pandemic and uh, geopolitics or rock and hard place or soldier and soldier with, with death looking at me, I certainly could have thought this isn't going to amount to anything, me being in here. I could have easily thought that. Why, am I, why does God have me here? This isn't going to do nothing. He could have easily thought that. Not true. 2,000 years later, uh, churches all over the land hear about Peter and are inspired by his faith and getting a revelation from God. But he certainly could have dwelt on, this is going to amount to nothing. He could have said, no one cares that I'm in here. No one even knows and no one even cares that I'm sitting, sitting in here, and rotting in this jail cell. And that would be untrue. If you're familiar with Acts 12, uh, there was a room full of gathered called the church and they were praying for Peter. Even though James had already died and even though it looked like that prayer didn't work, they were still praying for Peter. So no one knows, not true. I'm probably going to die in here. I'm going to die in here. I'm going to die. Oh my God, I'm going to die. Not true. Didn't happen. Because you'll find out if you're familiar with Acts 12 that the door to the prison was opened for Peter because he was able to rest, something that he could not have done on his own. Maybe I've got to try harder to get out of here. No, no. Rather, instead, he learned, I can depend on God, true. God is with me, true. I can rest in God, true. The Lord is my shepherd, true. God can do more with me asleep than I can do struggling in this jail cell, true. And an angel visited Peter and his chains fell off and the door to the jail cell was open. And this led Peter to, to speak this verse. Now I know God led me out of here. And, and the gift is to all of us, I think. Um, we, could have, we could have a revelation waiting, waiting at the door to our lives, calling us to walk through this door of dependence, but we just don't want to because it's a, it's, a, it, it's a place of desperation. Peter was in a place of desperation. You don't want to be between two soldiers in a jail cell. I understand that. And so it's hard. So Peter gets out of jail and he gets to the church, the, the house where they're all praying and he's knocking on the door. But no one believes it's Peter. And so they don't answer the door. A little girl named Rhoda says, hey, Peter's at the door. And they're like, no. No, no, that can't be Peter. Same thing for the word coming to all of us. I, God's saying, I, I have something to reveal to you. I'd love to give it to you. If you would quit wishing this moment away and engage the season of desperation as if you depend on me, I'm going to reveal something to you that you've never known about me before. And based on what you learn in this revelation after walking through the door of dependence, you're going to be glad you did. Maybe learn to rest by saying things to yourself that, that are only true. It just took something little. Rest. Rest is all he had to do. It may not be rest for you. I would say rest. But it may be something else little. We all want something grand to happen in our life and God to move. But quite often it happens when we do something little, rest. David didn't just immediately get in front of Goliath and do some awesome thing. He was called to do something little. Hear this. He was supposed to take bread to his brothers. That's all. That's how that started. So maybe it's not rest for you. I would invite you to ponder that. 
But maybe God is calling you to do something little to lead you into that place of dependence upon God. So as we, as we go into communion, reflect on that. It's a good word for all of us. Reflect on one of these questions sometime today. Number one, when you've been stuck in desperation, when you've been stuck in between rock and a hard place, when you've been stuck and it looks like there's nowhere to go, there really is no answer, what are you more prone to do? What is your common response? Are you fight, flight, freeze? Maybe you're flight. Maybe you escape. Maybe you do escapism into something. Instead of sit there in that desperate moment and depend on God. Or maybe you fight. Maybe you want to hold someone accountable. Maybe you want to beat someone over the head. And that ends up pouring out onto the people around you. Instead of depending on God. Just because you want it to end. What is, what is your common response in a season of desperation? Learn from Peter that God can do more while we rest than we can while straining at the oars. Or two, what door of dependence have you walked through? Name it. Or what door of dependence is God calling you to walk through? You know God is calling you to walk through some doorway, and, and to do it, you're going to have to depend on him. You can't, you, you're not doing that on your own. Peter wasn't doing this jail cell in between two soldiers on his own, and he went. What, what place of dependence is God calling you to? And you very well could be avoiding it. And this is another one of those places that are private. No one else knows about it because it's kind of between you and God. No one else sees it. It's just you and God. And you know you've sort of stiff-armed it for a while. Eh, 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 I don't think so. Where is that place of dependence that God is calling you? Or, finally... In what ways has God revealed himself to you? Maybe you have walked through doors of dependence. You've done it before. You knew God called you to do something that you couldn't do on your own, and you walked through that door, and God did reveal something to you about God that you did not know before. What is that? And, 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 and are you taking note of that? Because that's, that's gold. Share it with someone.